How are you? I hope you're having an incredible day and welcome to another episode on the Woman Who Roar series. Today we have Carly Perez, who is a former WWE champion. Yes, former wrestler in the WWE. And she recently started her own production company. She also is now investing in intellectual property. So she has a lot of knowledge to share with us about what it was like being a female in the WWE and how she made the transition into production. So I see that she sent in a request. So I am going to loop her in now. As we are connecting. Hey, hey everybody, hi. Hi mama. Hi. How are you, beautiful? Good. How are you? I am good. Thank you. First, of course, I want to say thank you so much um, for doing this again. For those who are not familiar, no, no. Carly and I tried to do this a couple of days ago, and Instagram was hating on me and didn't let me save the live, so I couldn't get the replay to you. And she dropped so many gems, so we needed to do it over again. So thank you <laughs> yeah. so much, Carly. No problem. <laughs> we got to get this knowledge out to the people. Okay, yes. so first things first. Let's start with WWE. How did you start in the WWE and what was your experience like? Um, I started, they actually came to me when I was uh, 19. I first attended college uh, for criminology to become a cop. And um, at the time I was working for the state attorney's office when WWE uh, approached my manager. So I did a lot of modeling through college and they approached my manager specifically looking for a multi-ethnic female. And uh, I happened to live also only 10 minutes away from the training facility, which was called FCW then. Uh, okay. And that was kind of how I started my career with them. And I started from scratch. I didn't know much about the business. Uh, I was just went in there kind of open-minded and um, wanting to learn. And then I stuck with it. And uh, I think that's important when you're starting something new, you know, you have to kind of get through those awkward moments where it's uncomfortable at first. Definitely. So let's talk about the training. So what was it like training for the WWE? The training was intense. It's crazy, especially when you're not used to being so physical. Uh, I, they just, uh, they definitely beat the crap out of me for a while there until um, until my, your body eventually becomes more accustomed to it. Right. And the physicalness doesn't take such a toll. It's just like any athlete, uh, you train your body to get used to it. So, but the training was definitely tough. It's the first year, year and a half. I, it, it took a minute for me to get comfortable. Mm -hmm. So describe a normal training day. Uh, we get there. I, my from what I remember I might have to be there at like eight thirty in the morning, eight thirty nine. If you're uh if you're late you have to stay after, you get in the ring, you we do probably about twenty minutes of stretching, we run ropes and then we literally go through matches. So we would have matches um in front of our peers with our peers. So was there a recovery period like between your trainings? Nope. We would do this <laughs> every day. This, your recovery period would be at home when you went to sleep and you wake up the next day and do it again. And then we would have uh, shows on the weekends. Wow. So they must have given you, I hope, part of your contract, like top-notch insurance. Yeah. So you're only – that's the thing, you know, with the company too, which was a uh, – um, he's gotten away with it for a long time because it's not union. So you're mm -hmm. only covered – when you're at work you're not covered outside of work so if something was to happen to you in the ring or while on the premises you know of training then you're covered but if you were to get sick or anything outside of that you have to have your own insurance and finding your own insurance to cover professional wrestlers is not the easiest thing to do right crazy yeah. okay yeah. so you you did this for like eight years right eight or yes. so years and you were on the road like 365 days a year. Yep, super intense. Days a year, every day. Yep. So, what made you stay that long for eight years? Um, I see if we have any injuries that linger. Um, yes, there were injuries. It's, uh, after 365 days a year, your body like just kind of gets wear and tear. Um, I've had a dislocated jaw, fractured nose. 
um, a really bad neck injury. Um, and what made me stay was I, I kind of got hooked and addicted to the adrenaline rush and performing. Um, and like what I, my personality type, like once I start something, I have to finish it. So I, I just, it pushed me every day just to keep on doing it until I felt like I reached my plateau and I could do more and I wanted to expand more into different careers. So when I reached that point mentally is when I finally left, but it was, um, I'm not going to, it wasn't easy getting up every day. Some days you just don't want to, you just don't want right. to do it. Right. <laughs> you don't Your body's there, so you don't fatigued. Do it. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine. So when they signed you up in your contract, did they put a certain amount of time that you owed them that you needed to stay? Um, typically, from my contracts were four years at a time. Okay. So yeah, four years at a time. I was going on to my third contract with them, and and I left uh, a little bit early into it. Got it. Got it. Okay. So. Your name was Maxine when you were in the yes, WWE? Yes, Maxine. Yep. So let's talk about it. And I know you shared this before, but talk to us about w why they give you an alternative name and the business side of that. Um, so that, that's ownership. You know, they own, they own your stage name. So obviously. the business um you would have to use your legal name uh if Got you're going to do anything while you're still in the business you'd have to pay them most likely a large percent got it and i had read thank you <laughs> i know everybody's checking in hey everybody um i had read somewhere that women in the wwe have the opportunity to make really good money is that because there's a scarcity of women or is that because anybody who's in the WWE is making good money? Um, you have, you make good, like, especially when I was, you know, 19 and starting, like that, it was great money to me at that age. Right. Um, but you work for your money there. Like, right. You, 365 days. Yeah. yeah like <laughs> you, make, you make decent money, uh, but you definitely put in, it's a lifestyle and you put in the work to live that kind of lifestyle to make a certain kind, you know, a certain amount of money. Um, but women are paid way less than the men. Um, mm -hmm. And we do, we are on the road the same amount of time. We do have to put in just as much work, um, if not more work on the, how we look, you know, from, not that the men don't take care of themselves and their body because they do, but just the hair, the maintenance of being a woman. Right. Uh, but we do make a significant amount less than the men do. Mm, that's annoying. And that has, you know, that's been shown in a lot of businesses. Mm -hmm, um, but and, and especially at sports and athletes, you know, like I know basketball and um, soccer. When, when, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, but uh, you, you, you can make a good living, you know, doing it as a woman. You just, but you're going to work. Yeah. So when you say good living, is it like six figures a year? Is it seven figures a year? Like um, what's when, the So when you get to the six figure mark, uh, they actually make you pay for your own travel and hotels. Wow. Yeah. And that's where they get you too. Yeah. So imagine that's traveling for 65 days a year, making good money, and then you get to a certain mark and now you have to pay for your travel 365 days a year in your hotels and your rental car. And do so, they make you pay for glam too? Like your hair and makeup and everything? So you get hair and makeup done there at the facility, okay. at the facility uh, or wherever, wherever we're doing our show, but it's, we don't get extra. It's not like we get extra side money for you. You also can't be in the same clothes, you know, every week. Mm -hmm. So as a woman, we have to buy new, new clothes every week in order to be on camera. So it's not like you get extra for that or have money on the side for that. So what will happen is a lot of people will jump in one car together, one hotel room together and try to hunker down um, wow. because it will add up. So are you technically like an employee of the WWE or are those expenses you're able to write off? 
Like, are you yeah, considering you it independent? Write, you can write off uh, everything. You're not an employee. You're an, okay. you're an independent contractor. Got it. So okay. you can write sense. off uh, everything, but you and you better have a good uh, account, a good tax guy because yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a it's a different kind of uh, write offs and different kind of life, right? When you're right. traveling like that, so um, you can spend a lot of money, and if you don't have the right person doing your taxes for you, you you may slip. They may, they may uh, slip a. Uh, slip up you know yeah i can imagine you need a good accountant on deck as well as a good lawyer yes. right to go yeah, over would, kind of your contracts and that for sure yeah i was you know i was um uh I, for being young and i could have been young and stupid at the time but i put 50 percent away of every paycheck i ever got aside so 50 mm. percent went in 50 percent into savings and that actually helped Added yeah. Up. yeah, it helped a lot when I left the company and added up tremendously. Got it. Because I did see, sadly, it is a business that's very known for people to go broke. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what was it like being a woman in a super male dominated environment, industry? What was that experience like? Um, it's difficult. You know, like you have to have a, you got to have some thick skin for sure. You know, as a, as a, as a woman in a male dominated world, you, um, even the world I left for like, it's all been ma male dominated in both, uh, career choices I've gone into and you definitely have to have some thick skin. Yeah. Um, not doubt yourself. Um, not saying that all, not saying that all men are like that because there are very supportive men out there. But there's also people who will test you, mm -hmm. uh, men and women. But mm -hmm. when you're stepping into their grounds, there, there, there are there are men who can be threatened with that. So, would you, given your experience, recommend women thinking about the WWE as a possible career path? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I if you um. If you're extremely, if it's something that you truly want to do and like you can't live without doing it, then yes. If it's something you think you may want to do, then no. Okay, got <laughs> because it. Because it's it's not it's not for you know somebody who only. It's not for the not weak. Quite sure. <laughs> yeah. 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 Because that, it will eat you up, and you will get it will eat you out and spit you out. You know, like if mm -hmm. it's something that you're really and I, you know, they say that they say that about people coming to ho Hollywood to pursue acting, right? Like people say the same thing. Like if it's something that you're extremely passionate about and you can't live without it, then yes, go for it. Okay. I hope y'all are paying attention. <laughs> so if you don't, if you're not a thousand percent confident, don't do it. Um, so you had like a hundred thousand people tuning in live. So what did you do to train like your mind to to go into that type of arena and do things live? Like, did you have butterflies before you went on? Was there anything that you did to make sure that you show up in the right way? I definitely was uh, nervous. Um, but like I said, that adrenaline, I kind of got hooked on that adrenaline. And I got into this mindset of like uh, faking it till I make it, which helped me build the confidence. Mm -hmm. um, eventually it just became me. And it became what I did. So uh, it, it was no longer, I was no longer stepping into like foreign uh, shoes, you know, like I felt that's where I needed to be and that's where I belonged. And that changes your confidence for sure. Yeah. And when you own it, it just, your confidence level kind of boosts up. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And also, you know, putting in the practice of like on your yeah, moves and definitely that training. A repetition. Uh, is super important. That's with anything. Like you, you putting in the time and having the repetition and the drive is definitely super important. Definitely. How do you deal with groupies and just groupies. being, you know, famous in that world? Because it has an incredible loyal fan base. So what um, is that does. like? Like wrestling does have a massive fan base. Hi guys. Mwah. Um. <laughs> It uh, it was funny to see people like when you're on the road, um, 
you're living like a, a rock star life, right? You're on the road, you, you're in different countries, different states, you know, right. there's parties, there's alcohol, there's people, there's whatever you want there to be, it's there if you want it, uh-huh. it's there. But I would go back and we would go back to the hotel and we would like get off the tour bus and I'd see all these, um, you know, major fans in the lobby, like waiting for the guys, like with signs and stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. But then you see like the dudes, you know, waiting for the chicks. And it's like, oh my gosh, you're like, <laughs> it's like this, <laughs> you know, this is what, this is what it's like to be Kid Rock, you know? Like, yeah. You, know, like, you got like people in the... I thought that was so funny. I'd see these, you know, getting off the bus. I see these like cute little chicks waiting for the guys, and all of a sudden there's dudes sitting there waiting for me. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Did that take some like getting having, used to having the fans like that? Did Fun, that take actually. some getting used to? Really? Um, you know, it's uh, it did. It took some getting used to. Oh, my charger. It took some getting used to. It was um. But it was, you know, it's flattering. It was fun. It was definitely fun and entertaining. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so let's transition into what you decided to do after your time at the WWE and why you decided to make that transition. Okay. Um, one second, guys. I'm getting my charger. Um, so after I left... Um, after I left, uh, <laughs> I specifically wanted to uh, concentrate on um, acting and uh, producing and wanted to do, you know, wanted more control over my career. Um, and uh, I started to learn, I started to learn the importance of that in, in Hollywood and being able to be a creator. And when, um, when I left, I was with uh, I got brought to LA and I started working with Robert Rodriguez and I did a show Lucha and then um, after four seasons four years there I went on to uh, producing and I started investing uh, money in buying IPs and um, life rights and doing that it just opened up my mind and gave me that much more uh, creative sense that I really didn't get even in the, when I was wrestling. You know, I was able to start things from scratch and be mm-hmm. able to, like, see it unfold. And then it put me in a position where I was able to work with uh, people that I grew up watching and looked up to, um, directors, producers, writers. Um, I now have a team. You know, we have a, we have a team of six now, and uh, we have seven projects in the slate. Um, a few miniseries, films. Um, the la- the very first uh, Life Rights I bought, it was a gentleman named Victor Zapata, and he was out of Miami. And Victor was um, a rogue cop that was uh, part of the Miami River Cops, which was a group of cops, seven of them, that was taking out the Colombian drug lords, stealing their dope and cash, and then reselling their dope. And three drug lords were seen floating down the river dead. So mm-hmm. the last cop, all these these six row cops, all Latin from Miami, they left the boat, the drug lord's boat, with over $9 million worth of dope. And wow. the last cop standing went and hid in the mountains for seven years. He turned himself in. He was on the FBI's most wanted list. He was a convicted cop, thrown in jail, and he survived by working with the gangs in the prison. And now he's an electrician in Tampa, Florida. So I would hear, like, I heard that story and I was like, I want that. I want that story. Yeah. So that was the first one I bought. And that one's going to be a mini series. So guys, keep your eyes out. Um, We're turning that one into a limited series. But after I got the, I learned the logistics of it and how cool it was to be able to get a story like that and see, and do the creative process of putting together writers and getting scripts and directors and actors and people attached to this. I was like, wow, I want to keep doing this. Mm -hmm. So I just kept, um, I kept at it. And now we have seven up and going. So it's been very, very cool. It's been a very interesting. And my experience through WWE has definitely helped me get to this point too, just on the um, passion for entertainment. Mm -hmm. And work ethic. I would yeah, work ethic. It definitely, it definitely gave me that. It gave me the work ethic for sure. 
Um, so but it's it is, yeah. What was that? Go ahead, finish. Yeah, it's so important, I think, for anybody coming out here to Hollywood or anyone listening that's uh, in LA and wanting to get into the entertainment industry, um, learn how to own your, your, your IPs and your own projects. Like, it's super important. And then just put yourself in it. If you want to be act in it, it's yours. You don't have to wait on someone else to tell you, you know? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about what exactly it means to have the life rights for somebody. Because I think not too many folks understand like what that is exactly. So right. can you tell us a little bit more about that? So acquiring uh, life rights or IPs, like IPs is intellectual property, which could be a book or an article if you see a lot of things on television or films uh, based off of, you know, true events or somebody's life story, right? So IPs are that. A life, life rights is somebody's actual life. So if they had a really interesting, crazy life, uh, whether, whether it was, um, or outstanding life, whether it was an athlete or somebody like Victor Zapata, the cop I just told you about, um, it, that not every day. We're losing you a little bit. Your internet's a little choppy where you are. It's a little choppy. Hold on one second. Yeah. Is that better? Um, let's see. I need you to start talking. Okay. So if you have, um, if you want to go after somebody's life rights, you, um, you'd want to go to them and acquire about turning their their life rights into a film or television show and you definitely need a good attorney for that and um people will charge you or you would pay just based on um the story the importance of the story how long the story's been out all that can go into consideration so how much does that usually cost to get somebody to give you their so life it can really cost like if you think about it like people were bidding for like the harry potter books right like see these are all like different it's all different like for my first one was twenty five thousand, so it can all be you could pay a thousand you could pay 500 you could pay it, it it really all differs on the agreement and what you guys come to terms to okay so you have your budget for trying to get the life rights for somebody Mm -hmm. and then so you own those rights and then you are executive producing the series as well right correct yes You're so what does that producing. budget look like um on pay wise to actually pay for the project for it to like oh look. so that can be different too because you're going to look at um so whether it's the st studio you know putting up the money and or the network just buying it out and that also all that is determined also by location uh actors um writers directors that are attached like all of that determines that as well so mm -hmm. they all can range like and per when episode or films okay so how do you get paid out of it? Do you get paid once the series is out and live and streams? Do you get like a percentage? Once like how do you bought. get paid? Once it's bought. Okay. So once a network buys the project, you yes. get paid. Once there's money put on the table. <laughs> Got it. So that's how you get paid. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so the upfront investment of like the research of trying to find something that's actually story notable, right? Um, the research to find somebody that wants to hand over their life rights and paying for the life rights. What would you suggest somebody who's interested in being an investor? Mm -hmm. What should they think about in terms of how much is it really going to cost? All in. Um, on acquiring it? Yes. So um, I would recommend, like, really, if you do your research and you can find, if you find stories or articles, like, uh, articles that were came out maybe like 20 years ago maybe it was a crazy I don't know, serial killer or some crazy intense story and uh, it's like a one-page article you could turn that one-page article into a film and you could mm -hmm. acquire that one-page article for maybe close to nothing if you go back and you contact uh, 
the author of the or the journalist author of the article and or who owns the rights to that article so if you just do a little work you may be able to invest a, a chunk to almost nothing if you just actually put in a little bit of the time and work and that doesn't mean that that article that it's actually going to work and move for, forward but there are some interesting stories out there that have never been told mm -hmm. okay so it really depends it depends it on what depends. you're going after yeah okay and the ultimate goal is basically source an ip at a super super deep discount or at like a manageable price and right. the goal or is to get the network or get that one you get the one which then gives you the the chunk of money to be able to go and use right that meaning money to so get more ips right so the the formula is acquire low sell high that would be a great formula <laughs> Right, right. right. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much what what we do, right, on every day with our clothes, our shoes, our makeup. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. It's America, um, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, talk to us about how hard is it to actually pitch projects? Because I'm sure, like where you are right now, there's competition to get in front of these networks. Like, how does that process work? Do they host these kind of pitching? meetings open to the public? Do you need to have an insider? Like, how does that work? It's a good question. Let me make sure my phone is um, oh, so your Wi-Fi froze. One second. So how do you get to pitching? So pitching um, typically is an insider. Uh, whether so you have a lit agent there so there's more than one type of way so you can have a lit agent and a lit agent represents writers producers directors so they represent everybody on the literary side while talent agent has actors right so a lit agent can help set up those meetings uh, with studios and uh, other producers writers um, uh, networks Netflix HBO right and or you have the, the connect, the group, um, a group of connects where you can make that call and eventually you kind of develop this personal relationship with people. Mm -hmm. um, I had the personal relationships before the lit agent. I actually just signed with the lit agent this past year. Now, maybe only like four months ago before all this started happening. Um, it is not, um, once you're in though, once you're in and they know you, and they trust you, now you're building that circle of trust. So mm -hmm. you can keep going back to them with projects. Maybe they said no to one project, but maybe they like your next one. And mm -hmm. you're kind of developing this, um, you know, this co connects, you know, mm -hmm. this whole circle of connections. Um, and Hollywood is big, but it's not. So it, it's, it's definitely a niche thing, though. Got it. So did you have your insider because you were in the WWE and because you were acting um, with the it had, TV yeah, series? Yeah, it actually nothing, had nothing to do with WWE. Um, just being out here and um, having friendships and relationships and then really starting to learn that side of the business um, and asking questions. And when I was around... Uh, people who were successful in that side of the business. I really just wanted um, that kind of mentorship of learning, right. uh, which is very helpful. I think everyone needs a mentorship, um, a mentor. Uh, so I kind of learned from that, you know, um, on how I spent probably a good year and a half just learning that process. Um, and then mm -hmm. when I was in the rooms, I shut up and listened. I listen to people talk mm -hmm. and learn what was needed, what's not needed, how, what questions to ask. I just listened. I learned a lot that way. You can learn a lot when you mm -hmm. just listen to people, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for those who are interested in getting into the Hollywood space or just in general, the goal should always be how can you get in and be a fly on the wall so you can learn as much as possible so that when you're able to infiltrate, you're setting yourself up for success. Yes. Versus failure, because you did all your due diligence. Um, yes. So a lit agent, how do they get paid? Because that's now an additional expense. 
So how did they get so paid? A lit, a lit agent will get a percent off of your work. Okay, got so, it. Same thing as like a theatrical agent, right? So their job is to, the lit agent's job is to get you in front of those people, um, is to help you produce your projects. So if you sell that show, um, the lit agent gets a percent, whatever that may be, typically 10, 15, maybe up to 20, which is high, but a lit agent will get a percent of that sale price. So you can make them a lot of money, especially if you're a good producer. Right, right. You have that hit show. You make mm -hmm. the next, you know, you, you make the next office, you make the next Seinfeld, you make the next Breaking Bad, Walking Dead, whatever it may be. Uh, a lit agent's job is to help negotiate the, those contracts and get you in front of those people. So what, what does a, a pitch look like? Like, what do you need to make sure you include, like, in a pitch? Let's say the top five things you need to make sure you have in the pitch when you go and meet with the network. So that's another crazy thing about Hollywood is there are people who do pitches off, like, um, off, like, a, a sticky pad and they sell it. It's nuts. And mm -hmm. they sell it. Um, I like to be over prepared. Um, and I'm big on visuals. I always recommend having uh, visual art. Like I have um, posters, like a storyboard um, almost. Yeah, storyboard, or as we call them a pitch deck. So mm -hmm. we would have you would have the visuals, you would go over the pilot, which is the first episode, um, you would have it summarized between like the first, second, third episode, and then summarize into the next following seasons. So somebody can look at it and see where it can go longevity wise, mm. because everybody wants the show to go six seasons because mm -hmm. that's where the money is. Mm -hmm. So they want to know before they buy it, they want to know that this is, can go that route and this mm -hmm. can last that long. Mm -hmm. So you want to be able to have, and I like to just think of it as you're walking into a room where everyone, I don't want to use the word stupid, but <laughs> we're just think that they don't know anything. Right. You know, like I'm walking in the room, they know nothing. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to make this as easy as possible for them. Uh, almost like a kid with like a little drawing. Right. You know, I'm going to make sure that they understand what I'm putting in front of them and just assume that they know nothing. So, so do you feel that. like, so making it super simple and assume yep. they know nothing. Okay. So do you feel that being a woman is an advantage in those rooms or a disadvantage? Um, both, both, unfortunately. It can be an advantage. Well, n now more than ever is the time, which mm -hmm. is great. Like now mm -hmm. more than ever in history of time of entertainment, like right. now is the time. For because of Me Too, Me Too, it's time. Yep. Um, but also, so being a woman in the room can be, can catch attention and or a, be a distraction. Mm -hmm. um, and also, or which I've, I've experienced all of these <laughs> in rooms and or it can be like a, um, an ego competition with, uh, with other people, um, which you don't necessarily want to do that either. So and then on the flip side, like right now, like we just talked about, it is the time now more than ever. So this is, um, they're putting women in the room more. Mm -hmm. So they want women in the room more. So that's always a plus right there. Mm -hmm. And do you find that women are supportive of each other in the industry? Yes. Yeah, I okay. do. Okay. I do, fi I do find uh, it's, there's not a lot. Right. There's not a lot of uh, women female directors, female producers, there's not enough, actually, we need more, mm -hmm. um, which I've, I've seen a lot of, um, there's a lot of grants, there's a lot of schooling, there's a lot of uh, courses for free, if not for very inexpensive, to try to get more women involved. Mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. So can you share uh, how you choose to show up in these rooms, knowing that depending on who's in the room, it can be an advantage or disadvantage. Do you have like a protocol that you follow that you found works well for you when you go into these meetings or just operating on Hollywood in general? I, I hate to say this too, but the judging book by a cover thing, nobody wants to feel like they're being judged, but I do check out and see who's in the room and listen 
reacts to what they have to say because I can kind of feel out their personality before mm -hmm. I so I know how to gauge them correctly um, mm -hmm. that's not everybody communicates the same way so right. you kind of have to learn who you're communicating with what type of person it is man or woman mm -hmm. you know what type of man is it how does that man communicate best you know mm -hmm. you can kind of learn that within a few minutes of being in the room like is he funny are they sarcastic do they go with humor are they more serious what mm -hmm. is the how is this person the tone you know yeah I mean? okay so I kind of gauge that so is there so that's once you're in the room but in terms of you showing up in the room do you feel like you wear a certain type of clothing are you more covered up than usual do you do something with your hair have you been pressured um, to do I that st i stay i think i'd like to be myself but i i stay conservative you know i'm definitely not going out in my wrestling gear <laughs> right <laughs> uh, i stay um i stay conservative i wear black i like black I'm mm -hmm. a black person. I like to wear mm -hmm. black. So sometimes I walk in there like all Johnny Cash style, you know, most of right. the time. <laughs> you know, but um, hair, maybe a little soft because it, it can be a little my straight black hair. I can look like I'm, a, I'm about to like ninja jump you or something. So yeah. I maybe soften it up with some waves a little bit here and there. But, you know, I try not to do anything overkill over the top. And mm -hmm. I, I don't like the super bright. Uh, colors of meeting. Do you see other women doing the same or are they doing something different? I don't know. Like, I've noticed some people, sometimes people walk in in sweats in meetings and I'm like, hey, that's cool. I want mm -hmm. I to, so I try to go like right in the middle. So I've, yeah. I've worn jeans with heels in meetings. I've worn dresses in meetings. I haven't done the sweats thing yet. Right, right, I've right. Seen people, <laughs> I've seen people go over overkill and then like nothing, like like, I don't care today. I'm like, that's cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So do what feels right to you, but yeah, be mindful. Your individual personality. You right. Know, that's right. going to be part of your delivery. Right. So when you made the transition from Tampa to Hollywood, was there ever a time where you felt like you might be losing yourself because the 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 myths and maybe truths around Hollywood is there's a lot of ingenuous ingenuineness there's a lot of fakeness going on so did you have to manage that and if so how did you yes I did um and I also this is, we have a good question here how does the intersection of race and gender play in these conversations and producing so talk to your question in this question I did have to Hollywood, Florida, and wrestling in Hollywood. Uh, wrestling and Hollywood are like similar when it comes to like entertainment. Uh, obviously, both entertainment, but there's a, um, a so-called like a hierarchy, right? So it's almost like you're competing, but you work better together. Mm -hmm. You know, on, on both sides, uh, both in wrestling and Hollywood. Um, but Hollywood, they will, like, you can get lost here very, very easily if you're not on the right track. Mm -hmm. um, race and gender play a big part, uh, obviously, in, like, everyday life. Like, if we look at America right now and what we're all going through. But if, uh, when producing or, like, being in the room, it definitely does. Like, it's kind of crazy Hollywood is been so one-sided for so long right which is a known thing and um now over the past like handful of years uh we see a lot more uh film and television for different races um or people you know we have african americans who have are starring in their own shows you know we have latins we have asians you know now um it's pretty it's incredible it's great and gender definitely took a big toll because um, women have been fighting for so long in Hollywood to have equal pay. There's star actresses who are, you know, aside the co their co uh, partner, the co actor who's a male, they're and they're making half of right. the money. Mm -hmm. You know, like so when you're in the room, you know, and you're putting together your own thoughts and projects something that you're producing you have to take all that in consideration because you're dealing with some old 
school Hollywood people in the room and you're dealing with new generation Holly, Hollywood people in the room, mm-hmm. all mixed. So everyone's going to have different, different ideas and points. Um, and I would always recommend sometimes you just have to get through that first one in order to have more control. Sometimes you have to do things that you wouldn't want to do. You have to take less money. You have to do a little bit of less here, a little bit less there, just so you can have that it's stuff. Put in the door. The right. Yeah. Hmm. And I didn't learn that until I was older. Because <laughs> hmm. I was like, no, I'm going right. to, you're going to pay me the same. We're going to be equal. We're going to like, and now it's like, mm, but I'm going to, okay, I see what you did there. I'll, mm-hmm. I'll come back around over here and get that mm-hmm. next time, you know? Mm-hmm. Like sometimes you have to learn how to play that game. Right. So that since, you, you, <laughs> since you learned how to play the game and you kind of have, you understand what's the, you know, what's the playing ground, but there obviously still is an imbalance Do you plan to do anything? Because obviously you're going to kick it off with the production of this series and you're going to continue to invest in IPs, et cetera. So is your plan to do anything about that? Is that something you're passionate about? It definitely is. Yeah, I definitely want to um, help make... I fought that in the wrestling business, you know, for myself, you know, for myself. And I kind of got... I kind of got a shit on for it, you know, like I'd have my own discussions mm-hmm. trying to get uh, what would equally right and fair. Um, but the reason, like, like we talked about, the reason I got into the IPs and life stories and owning them is so I could have more control. So as it keeps growing, as I keep growing, uh, the more, the more I can say and put on the table, the more I would like to help uh, minorities and uh, women as well develop projects like this and be able to get get paid for it and mm-hmm. be able to tell their story all mm-hmm. the projects I have are all minority based projects too oh so okay that's, that's yeah so whether uh, African American culture or Latin culture or um, you know minority women they're all minority based uh, leads and stories mm-hmm. so I, I love that to stick, stick with that um, so far mm-hmm. that's kind of what I've been putting out there so that's good I love. I wanted to go back to the race question real quick. So how do you identify? Because you're mixed, right? Mm-hmm. So you're I'm Cuban. So Cuban, Italian, Hawaiian, and Chinese. Correct. So which do you identify most with? Um, well, I guess I'm put more in, like, you would look at my Carly Leilani Perez. You're like, I don't know which one. She's <laughs> but I'm right. put into the Latin category, the the most probably right. and I I think um whether that's just because my last name but my mother's from Hawaii my mother's Polynesian and oh, my father's okay. side my grandmother's from Cuba my grandfather's from Sicily but I think mm-hmm. just to me I'm put into that box because it makes it easier to, mm-hmm. to be put into that box you know mm-hmm. like I think people just automatically do that <laughs> which mm-hmm. is fine I don't so you don't mind that part part of me i don't mind what am i gonna do say no right (laughs) no i'm not don't put me in the latin box you know right right right. i can't can't get away with it the last name perez so (laughs) right right (laughs) uh okay so so what is the next step so you're just gonna focus primarily on executive producing on continuing to invest in ips like the next five years where are you Yes. So, um, I'm also like in all my projects, I'm putting, putting, uh, myself acting in it. I'm having acting roles in all my projects. I'm going to continue executive producing. What has been happening now is I'm getting projects from other people who need help producing their projects. Mm -hmm. So that's been really cool. So I've been getting calls and emails with projects who need help finding a writer or showrunner or director. And I now have connections into that so i'm helping produce their stuff so i can get a mm-hmm. producer credit there it may not be an ep credit but it's a producer credit so Got i'm just going to keep continue um yeah keep growing these projects and uh, continue buying uh life rights and ips um it takes time you know like projects don't happen overnight these kind of things mm-hmm. take time sometimes it takes years mm-hmm. um there's one I've had now for two years up and going. Um, but then I have two other ones that are like quickly going, 
you hmm. know, like it's, it's, a, it's, it's weird. Um, and if you find one that's slower, I would, I would recommend just go and concentrate, concentrate on one that's moving smoothly and then go mm-hmm. back to that one. Like you, you kind of learn how to uh, uh, balance them. Um, so I want to keep executive producing, acting, uh, and creating content. Um, yeah, I want to be able to have a, a, a solid hit show and and film out there. You know, mm-hmm. that, that's mm-hmm. a good goal of mine. Okay. Well, it is coming. I will get my autograph next time I'm in Cali. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is a question that I ask all of my guests, and it is, "Why are you a woman who wars?" Um, why am I a woman that wars? Um, By the way, your dog is so cute. I say hi, Ray. Thank you. <laughs> um, I get up every day, um, ready to fight and keep going. And um, if I get a roadblock, I just pound through it. I mean, there's no, um, I don't have a, in my mind stopping and taking breaks is not an option, and no is not an option. So. Mm, I love and that. I I'm a woman who wore because no is not an option. Too. No is not an yes. option. Come on, life. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Making your cameo over there. Yes. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much again, Carly, for being on the show. And of course, for joining me again. Hopefully, Instagram doesn't act up now. But I really appreciate you being on the show. Wish you the best of luck in, of every, in everything. And everybody, keep an eye out for your series that launches. Thank you. I'll talk to all you All right, soon. Mama.